As New Zealanders, we have the most bizarre relationship with buildings. You see, they are the things we have traditionally spent the most money on. We've invested in our property. Yet, what we've actually built is utter rubbish. <laughs> and I really mean that. I mean houses with a shelf life of less than 50 years. Houses that leak, that are cold and mouldy. Houses that make us so sick, we end up tearing them back down again. In fact, the situation in this country, in New Zealand, is so bad that if this represents a section of our landfill, a cross-section, what you'll find is that half of it is made up of bits of our own buildings. What on earth are we thinking? And the appalling reality is we are about to build a lot more of these shitty houses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have KiwiBuild, this ambitious target of 100,000 homes in the next 10 years. We are off to an awfully slow start, as you all know. But that is a lot of houses. Alarmingly, however, KiwiBuild is merely a blip on the housing demands of this modern world. In the next 80 years, it's estimated that we need an additional 2 billion houses. That is an inconceivable quantity. It is, in fact, twice the number of houses that we as a species have ever built. Some see this as an incredible opportunity, an opportunity to completely redefine the way that we as humans live on this earth. And that's wonderful. But the truth of the situation is that if we continue to build these two billion houses the way we do today, we will cripple our planet. Our current methods of material consumption, extraction, and disposal are utterly incompatible with nature. Nothing in our natural ecosystems will do this to create its shelter. Our take, make, and dispose, dispose attitude is a one-way ticket to an environmental calamity. And I don't know if it is out of guilt or some deep, innate human desire to not destroy the thing that keeps us alive, the planet, but we have tried to address this issue. Our response has been recycling, and of course, I don't need to tell you just how successful recycling as a waste management strategy is. It's very interesting, though, because for the same reason that we send so much of our plastic to our landfills, building materials also are not recycled. And this issue comes back to the way the buildings are built. So if we have a look at your section of your average wall in New Zealand, so this is a section of your average wall in New Zealand. So the cladding on the outside, fibre cement sheet, the next layer, the control layers, these control the air, the insulation, the structure, and the internal lining. This is fairly representative of almost every house built in New Zealand today. And what happens when you try and pull these components apart at the end of their life is something I prepared earlier. It's this. <laughs> it is fundamentally contaminated materials with absolutely no value at the end of their life. And this issue is systemic. So again, this product, fibre cement sheet, it's found as a cladding product on almost 40% of all houses built in New Zealand. Now this material, it's nailed at its back and glued to a timber batten. This timber product is called a cavity batten and it serves a really important job. However, in New Zealand, this product is treated with three chemicals to prevent it from rotting. Copper, chrome, and arsenic. Now, you're probably not surprised to learn that given arsenic's relationship with skin, bladder, and lung cancer, that this product has been outlawed in Canada, in America, in Europe, and in Australia. And at the end of the building's life, this copper, chrome, fibre, cement, nail, glue sandwich goes straight in our landfills. More absolutely outrageous issues occur with this layer. This fabric-y stuff, 
It's essentially an enormous plastic bag that's wrapped around your house to keep the warm air in and the cold air out. Now what this also does, conveniently, is trap all of the toxic gases created by these materials inside of your house with you to breathe. And at the end of the building's life, this monolithic plastic house blanket, contaminated by hundreds of fixing holes, tapes and adhesives, it too joins the arsenic and the fibre cement in our landfills. <sighs> Ironically, for a country that just said no to single-use plastic, there's more single-use plastic in your average wall than one person will produce in a decade. And there's more issues, right? This stuff, we've all got it in our homes, it's rubbish. This stuff, <laughs> our timber structural framing, it is not certified to be reused in this country. So where does it go? It goes into our landfill. This stuff, plasterboard, again on almost every home's wall in this country, <laughs> contaminated with no value, goes to landfill. And if that's not bad enough, a new trend in our industry is to fill this cavity here with expanding spray foam insulation. Never done this before, so we'll find out. So what that does is further contaminate the materials, reducing any chance of material recovery. So at this point, <laughs> It should be pointed out that the end product, the wall, although in my view it's a steaming pile of garbage, <laughs> is actually reasonably functional while it's in use. It is watertight, sometimes. It's energy efficient, it's airtight, and as I've demonstrated to you, it is designed specifically to never come apart and never break down. And some people will tell you, you know what, that's a great thing. We don't want our buildings to fall apart. They should stay together, they should last forever. However, as I've shown you, our buildings do not last forever. Whether it be a natural disaster, like the Christchurch earthquakes, or a man-made disaster, like the leaky building crisis, or simply by the merits of human nature, our buildings do not last. So that is the state of affairs today. It's a building industry with absolutely no consideration as to how its materials can be recovered or repurposed in the future. It's a disposable model. There has to be a better way, right? a way of building the shelter that we need on the scale that we need that is inherently designed for the future. This little problem has been my problem. So for the past two years, as a PhD student in architecture at Victoria University of Wellington, under the supervision of three wonderful supervisors, we have set out to create a way of building that is, at its core, without waste. Imagine a set of lightweight, flexible and adaptable building components that are designed specifically from the ground up to be endlessly reusable. Let's exploit the advantages of modern digital fabrication. Accurate, reliable and massively scalable fabrication to produce a set of building parts that are so completely optimised in their point of manufacture that they can be created without waste. Through this precision of modern fabrication, these components can be detailed in a way in which they become self-connecting, rejecting the very need for glues and screws and nails. And rather than being restrictive, these parts form an open and flexible toolbox for housing and shelter. This is not some prefabricated dystopian vision of housing, but a way of building that is, from its very design, personal. It's flexible. Again, through design, 
we have essentially democratised the house building and unbuilding process, allowing those with very little knowledge of buildings to easily adapt the space that they live within. Now this is also a way of building that rejects dependency. So the adjoining layers that we need, the wall linings, they can be quickly and easily added, removed, relocated or unsold. Once again, through design, we've enabled the circular economy. We've made it possible for a reuse economy to take place. And these components, now they can come together into a pallet and they can move from site to site directly with exactly the same components forming roofs, walls and floors. The same components working as internal partitions or as temporary structures. And it's my pleasure to tell you that this is not just some vision or fantasy, but this is an attainable future. It's an example of a completely reimagined building industry. One that stewards materials from the cradle in the pure natural ecosystem of this planet through into useful building materials, into buildings, and then at the end of those buildings' lives, into new buildings, again and again. Instead of a building industry literally held together with layers of petrochemical mush, now we have a reusable assembly of naturally durable materials. In fact, a material that stores carbon in a structural geometry that is inherently resistant to earthquakes. This is a way of building that is quite simply cheaper, more efficient and stronger than the status quo. But again, it's not all that straightforward, is it? We, as a species, have an inbuilt reluctance to invest in our own collective futures. You know, to get us to stop using plastic bags, we had to ban them outright. What on earth are we going to do with buildings? We cannot ban buildings. The reason that I'm standing here today on this TED stage advocating for this is because a technical solution is only part of the answer. To transition our building industry from a take-make disposable industry into one that is inherently designed for the future, well, that requires human ambition, and that requires an ambition to invest in our collective futures. And it's for this reason that I want to finish with a vision of that future. So imagine that a young couple are having a child, and they need some more space in that home, quickly and at little cost. Luckily, their uncle, he's downsizing. These components can change hands, and that child gets to grow up in a warm, dry and healthy home. That child, when they're an adult, has the capacity to, to take parts of that home with them to start their new life. Imagine a built environment that openly accepts change. A responsive, responsible infrastructure. A house not as some trophy of financial gain, but as an ability of our species to invest in the future. Thank you.